Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future, coming to you from Burlington, Vermont, from Channel 17 Town Meeting TV, Center for Media and Democracy. I am your host, Margaret Harrington, and please welcome via Zoom during this COVID time, our very best, Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Margaret. Good to be here. Yes, it's so good to see you. And I see the map of Vermont right behind your, your right shoulder there. That's right. So, Close to my heart. Yes. And I know you've been very active throughout this the time of, uh, of uh, the decommissioning of Vermont uh, Yankee. And the, the, the topic that we have chosen to do is climate change and the hazards of, of uh, nuclear transport. So Kevin, to launch us into our 2021st year, could you tell us what are the main things that are on your mind as, a, as an anti-nuclear activist and relevant in particular to our, our situation here in Vermont? Sure, well, it's interesting that at 12 noon on January 20th, 2021, Vice President Harris and President Biden took their oaths of office. So it's a new era in, in major ways, um, soon to be confirmed as budget committee chairman in the US Senate as Bernie Sanders. And interestingly, ironically, also that same evening, the Vermont uh, NDCAP Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Board Subcommittee on National Policy also had a meeting. And what's been really kind of uh, simmering at the NDCAP all last year, and even before that, was a position that the NDCAP took in 2015 at the behest of Yankee Atomic, the original owner of Vermont Yankee, but also the owner of such other New England atomic reactors as Yankee Row in Massachusetts and Maine Yankee and others. The um, advocacy in support of consolidated interim storage facilities. And so it's really been um, sticking out like a sore thumb for many years. And there's been pushback, including by certain members of the NDCAP panel. And last night, the subcommittee met to really establish a new pathway going forward to reconsider the position, reevaluate their position, decide what their position is. So it's very relevant to Vermont. Um, it's a really untenable position that they've taken and not fixed in all these five, six years since. I mean, just on the face of it, the environmental injustice of simply moving Vermont Yankees waste out to Texas and or New Mexico into um, majority minority communities, specifically now Latino communities that live right there that have already borne a tremendous burden of not only fossil fuel pollution from the Permian Basin the most active oil and gas fields on the planet, unfortunately, worse than Saudi Arabia, worse than Alberta, Canada, but also in a sense, uh, they have borne the brunt of the worst of the atomic age thus far from Los Alamos beginning in 1943 to uranium mining in Northwest New Mexico early on in the 1950s even to the waste isolation pilot plant uh, which is military plutonium waste being dumped permanently underground. Uh, that is 16 miles away from the Holtec, New Mexico site. Now Holtec, New Mexico and um, North Star waste control specialists in Texas wanting to add high level radioactive waste to the environmental justice burdens out there. And of course you can't just magically teleport the wastes out there they would have to travel through most states in the lower 48. And that includes Vermont. It's not just a question of Vermont exporting its own waste elsewhere. But if you look at the details of the maps for the transportation routes, other New England atomic reactors would have to ship their wastes through Vermont to get out west. And while the industry, as is its way, would like to downplay the risks of high level nuclear waste transportation, that nothing possibly could go wrong, uh, a lot could go wrong. And hence our slogans for the risks, uh, mobile Chernobyl in terms of the road and rail shipments, floating Fukushima's in terms of the 
barred shipments that are possible, uh, dirty bombs on wheels in terms of the security risks of attackers actually attempting to blow up these shipments uh, in strategic locations like major urban centers that they would pass through because they're gonna pass through a hundred of the biggest cities in the United States on their way out West. And even uh, mobile X-ray machines that can't be turned off in terms of the inevitable gamma and neutron radiation doses that will be inflicted on people who live along these transportation routes because these containers are not designed to contain all of the radiation. Some is streaming out even under routine shipment conditions without an accident, without an attack. So all of that is in play with this subcommittee and then the committee of the ENDICAP. And that's why Vermonters and residents of Massachusetts and residents of New Hampshire, because that is the composition of the ENDICAP, there's represent, representation from all three states given Vermont Yankees location, should all be engaged in trying to get the ENDICAP to take a better position on consolidated interim storage facilities. So, so Kevin, the, the, the good news is that this is not a done deal. It is not, has not been decided or set in stone that there will be a transport of nuclear waste, of high level nuclear waste out, out to Holtec, which would, would be an intermediate storage, interim storage facility. And According to what, what I have learned from you and other advocates over the years is that it's actually illegal to, to put this waste into an interim storage until there is a permanent storage site. Right, is yeah. In, in addition to being an environmental injustice and not consent based because there is not consent from New Mexico or Texas for these proposals, just as there is no consent for the Yucca Mountain dump on Western Shoshone land in Nevada, those are not legally binding requirements, unfortunately. Consent-based siting and environmental justice are not legally binding. They're certainly morally binding, and maybe we can get them to become legally binding uh, through congressional legislation at some point. But what is legally binding, and we are supposed to be a nation of laws, rule of law, is a law like the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 as amended, which has its flaws, believe you me, like singling out Yucca Mountain, Nevada against the will of the people of Nevada and the Western Shoshone. But um, there is a legal prohibition, as you mentioned, against consolidated interim storage, at least if the US Department of Energy is gonna be involved in the absence of a permanent repository. There is no permanent repository in the United States. Yucca Mountain has been canceled and may become even more canceled now that Biden is president because it was under the Obama administration when Joe Biden was vice president that Yucca Mountain uh, was canceled. Uh, there have been attempts to resurrect it by especially congressional Republicans since. Now that Biden is president, I hope that his administration will simply Put the final nail in the coffin of the Yucca Mountain dump and get it off the table. But since there is no permanent repository and the Department of Energy has estimated it will take until at least the year 2048 and, and likely now further beyond that to open the first repository, therefore the Department of Energy can't be involved in consolidated interim storage at New Mexico or Texas, specifically in the ways of taking title, taking ownership to the commercial irradiated nuclear fuel, paying for the interim storage costs, and that would include transportation, that would include building the facilities in Texas and New Mexico, operating the facilities there. These are multi-billion dollar schemes. And the companies involved like Holtec in New Mexico, like Orano of France and Waste Control Specialists of Texas in Texas, um, they don't wanna spend the money. They want the Department of Energy, that is the taxpayers, to spend the money, which is, as you said, Margaret, illegal, and it's not a done deal. I mean, we have a coalition that includes Beyond Nuclear, it includes Sierra Club nationally, it includes a grassroots coalition of groups uh, that, that is called Don't Waste Michigan and others. It's seven grassroots groups from across the country. We are all in federal court. We are in the second highest court in the land, the DC, Court of Appeals just under the Supreme Court with our cases against 
Holtec in New Mexico and waste control specialists in Texas. Unfortunately, the court has ruled that we have to wait until the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has issued a record of decision granting the licenses to those facilities. Something that could happen this year, they are finalizing the paperwork, things like the final environmental impact statement and the final safety evaluation report at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission at the staff level, which then tees it up for the NRC commissioners to simply rubber stamp the construction and operating licenses, which they seem keen to do. Although we'll see with the change in leadership under the Obama administration, if things change, but it is not a done deal. Those are just the, the formal official proceedings. Then you've got the, the court of public opinion You've got grassroots resistance, uh, not just in the Southwest, but nationwide. So it is not a done deal, the fight is on. And that's why I mentioned Endicap in Vermont because that hard won subcommittee formation to get that official endorsement of consolidated interim storage uh, removed at the Endicap would be a huge victory for environmental justice. So how, how do you see it? unfolding i mean given the, their track record they've been they were formed in 2014 or 15 right and they've been discussing this for for seven six or seven years so how and and where does where does their decision fit into the department of energy's overall judgment on this and decisions well, um, you know, thank you to groups like um, Vermont Yankee Decommissioning Alliance and Vermont Citizens Awareness Network for winning this uh, movement at the ENDICAP to form this subcommittee to reevaluate its position. The position that the ENDICAP took in 2015 at the behest of the nuclear industry was really rushed. And in fact, most panelists didn't even know the decision was going to happen before it happened. So it was a very bad process. They simply endorsed the position of Yankee Atomic. And in the meetings during 2020 and the Endicap meets about once a season, once every three months, the full committee, the full panel, and then the subcommittee now is gonna meet in between. Um, there were indications from panelists that they didn't know about the previous position. They didn't agree with the previous position. Some are opposed to the previous position. So hopefully this bad position that was taken in a great big hurry with no due process in 2015, really by the, the chair of the ENDICAP at the time, can be reevaluated and a much more responsible position can be taken. In terms of the relevance at the national level, it is very important. I mean, you've got um, US Representative Peter Welsh, who has kind of uh, depended on not only the ENDICAPs, irresponsible position, but other pressures from the likes of um, Entergy in Vermont, and even now North Star, which owns the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant, to simply get the waste out of Vermont um, with little thought as to how it's going to leave, how it's going to travel, and where it's going to go. And he has voted that way for years now, irresponsibly. And so perhaps with a change at the end of cap, that will create some momentum, and certainly viewers um, should be contacting U.S. Representative Welsh to change his position on the Yucca Mountain dump in Nevada on consolidated interim storage in New Mexico and Texas. Like I said, the environmental injustice alone is reason enough for him to be voting against these proposals. And then, as mentioned, uh, Bernie Sanders being, you know, a top contender in the Democratic uh, primary for president, and now being a, a powerful committee chair in the US Senate has a lot of sway at the federal level. And hopefully with his good position, because he has come out against consolidated interim storage, he can influence the Biden administration. Um, one thing I should mention is, you know, uh, climate is a part of our conversation today. The Biden administration has come out swinging on climate just in the last couple days of being in office. And, um, the one thing to keep in mind though, is that this whole issue of consolidated interim storage got a huge boost, unfortunately, from the Obama administration Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, which issued its final report in January of 2012 after a two year public engagement process where people spoke out strongly against consolidated interim storage. So they did not, the, 
the Blue Ribbon Commission did not listen to us. So that, you know, Biden had a hand in that, in that he was vice president of that Obama presidency. So we have to get Biden to reconsider that previous position from eight years ago about consolidated interim storage. Another top recommendation of the Blue Ribbon Commission was consent-based siting. And um, they certainly do not have that in New Mexico, in Texas, in Nevada. So that is grounds for reconsidering the current proposals for dumps in those three states. And I'm hopeful that, that the Biden administration now can be uh, moved to reconsider the current plans for consolidated interim storage because they are faulty. They are not based on consent-based siting. And Kevin, could you could you show could you tell us what how how is the federal government uh, sitting at what level to the state's decisions? For instance, if the Vermont legislature decided that no, there could be no transport of nuclear waste from Vermont from uh, North Star of Vermont Yankee right now or at any time out to interim storage. How would, how would that, and the federal government, the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, whoever is involved in that, they, and they decided that yes, we're going to have interim storage of high level nuclear waste. How would that be a fight between states and, and federal, federal government? It's all in the mix. It's a great big tug of war. I mean, um, one, one thing that's going on is, uh, you know, that Peter Welsh, now that the Democrats are back in control of the House, he is a senior Democrat in the U.S. House. So he has- Of the state, uh, of the Senate, yeah. Well, um, Peter Welsh in the U.S. House, Bernie Sanders in the U.S. Senate, um, right, right, uh, yeah. have big sway because of their seniority in each chamber. And, you know, Peter Welsh is on the powerful Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, that's where he's been making these votes in favor of consolidated interim storage, in favor of the Yucca Mountain dump. And we're hopeful that given his political power, um, he can change his bad position into a better position. Something we've been calling for, uh, we called for it for all two years of the Blue Ribbon Commission, it fell on deaf ears, is the need for hardened on site storage or in places that may be unsuitable for on-site storage as due to climate change, for example, hardened near-site storage. And Vermont Yankee being on the banks of the Connecticut River, climate change is a real issue. Um, also reactors on the, on the shores of the Great Lakes, also reactors on the seacoasts. I mean, with rising sea level, with historic flooding on rivers, with historic high waters in the Great Lakes. We have to consider moving the wastes from where they are right now, further inland to higher ground, but not a thousand or 2000 miles across the country to the border of Texas and New Mexico, but rather miles inland perhaps, or not even that, uh, just to higher ground to get them out of the floodplain that is getting worse because of climate change. So, those are the kind of positions we, we need leadership on from folks like Welsh and Sanders. And I'm hopeful that with uh, a Biden administration um, speaking so strongly and taking action on climate, I mean, Biden on day one rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement internationally. So there is hope. Um, his nominee for energy secretary, Jennifer Granholm, a former governor of Michigan, is also speaking strongly on climate. She's had good renewable energy policy. For example, offshore wind in the Great Lakes was a very responsible, careful policy that she had as a governor of Michigan. Unfortunately, and I'm a member of the board of Don't Waste Michigan uh, still, uh, 20, 30 years in now, um, her position on nuclear power was less responsible. It was neutral at best and actually simply in um, in alliance with the nuclear utilities of Michigan. So I think we have work to do, even on President Biden, even on an Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, if she's confirmed. Um, even Biden's uh, um, choice for climate czar domestically, which is not needing Senate confirmation. So Gina McCarthy, former EPA Administrator under Obama, is in at the White House has good climate policy under Obama's clean power plan, the nuclear power industry did not get 
the massive subsidies that it sought. That was a huge victory. And, you know, hats off to Tim Judson at Nuclear Information and Resource Service on that issue. He organized the coalition in DC who met with uh, the Obama EPA on that issue and really won a victory with the Clean Power Plan that it did not subsidize nuclear power. Well, she's now in a powerful position as climate czar at the White House. She too, like Jennifer Granholm, has skeletons in her closet on nuclear power. So for example, on the very last day of the Obama administration, no exaggeration, Gina McCarthy signed an EPA policy called Protective Action Guidelines in nuclear emergencies, increasing the allowable concentration of radioactive poisons in food, in water, drinking water, in air, in the environment during a nuclear emergency that was ill-defined and without time limit. It was a huge giveaway to the nuclear lobby in this country. The George W. Bush administration had tried to pass that change and did not. Again, hats off to people like Diane DiRigo at NEARS who have, have led coalition efforts against that for years and decades. Well, um, under Gina McCarthy in the Obama administration on the last day in office, she signed off on that horrible regulatory rollback. Hopefully it will never be invoked, but the nuclear emergency definition was so ill-defined that it could be anything from a low-level radioactive waste transportation accident to a major atomic reactor meltdown and anything in between. And not only did it establish bad rules for a nuclear emergency situation, it also set a bad precedent for other areas of nuclear environmental protection um, in terms of radioactive waste dumps leaking, atomic reactors allowed to release radioactivity into the environment. If it's okay during a nuclear emergency, well, maybe we can consider weakening the rules elsewhere in the nuclear industry. And that was Gina McCarthy. So we need, uh, my point is we need to push back on President Biden, on uh, Gina McCarthy at the White House Climate Czar's office, uh, if confirmed, Grand Home as energy secretary to get them in better positions. So we have our work cut out for us, not only in Vermont, but across the country. Right, and, and the issues that you bring up are not even about the, the people, the educators and the people in some power throughout the country who, who still consider nuclear power to be a green energy. This is what we came up against here in Vermont before the decommissioning or the closing of Vermont Yankee, that there were huge advertisements in, the pay, in then the print papers and all over that nuclear energy is green energy. And that, that is raising its head again, as, as you well know, right? Both in academia and in, uh, in uh, people who are uh, advisors to legislators, so. Well, now that the Trump era is thankfully over to some extent, now that Trump is out of office, um, something that occurred to me during even the first days of the Trump administration was it all seemed so bewildering and chaotic. But I realized that we've been facing that in the nuclear power fight uh, for decades. The nuclear power industry is a propagandistic industry. They have bottomless coffers. Um, often it's public money that they are subsidized with uh, in all kinds of ways. The same is true of the nuclear weapons industry, of course. And they use their vast resources to try to bamboozle the public about how clean and green nuclear power is. Well, that's our challenge is to push back and to educate the public um, about the truth on these matters. So, um, you know, in terms of nuclear power being some kind of climate change solution, I mean, the um, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, uh, Dr. Bryce Smith, who was chief scientist at the time in 2006, wrote the book, the best book I've ever read about why nuclear power is not the solution to the climate crisis. It was entitled Insurmountable Risks. And what they pointed out in their book was, um, look at um, how much nuclear power costs, look how long it takes to deploy it cannot solve the climate crisis. The climate crisis is too fast breaking. And if you spend that much money on nuclear, you can't spend it on energy efficiency and renewables, which are the actual solutions. 
So you will not only not solve the problem, you will make sure that you can't solve the problem. You've wasted all the money on a dead end nuclear power. And then the insurmountable risks part was a long list of the problems that nuclear power itself brings with it. One of the top ones for IEER was nuclear weapons proliferation. Everywhere that nuclear power goes, nuclear weapons are a half step behind if the holders of that technology choose to use it that way. Uranium enrichment. If you enrich to weapons grade, you've got weapons usable, highly enriched uranium. If you use reprocessing of high level radioactive waste to separate out plutonium, it is weapons usable and reactors make plutonium in the waste. So weapons proliferation, um, the dilemma of the radioactive waste problem that is still unsolved some 80 years into this problem. You know, Enrico Fermi first split the atom, fired up the first atomic reactor in the Manhattan Project on December 2nd, 1942. And we haven't solved the first cup full of high level radioactive waste that he generated. We don't know what to do with it. So that, that has to start begging some questions. We can't seem to solve this high level radioactive waste problem. And it's a huge risk. And then other issues that that book brought up before Fukushima was the risk of catastrophic accidents. So they mostly focused on Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, but the potential for as bad or worse, Fukushima happened five years after the book came out. And we, with our aged reactors in places like upstate New York, some are more than 50 years old on the Lake Ontario shoreline there. We're really pushing the, the envelope on age-related breakdown phase atomic reactor disasters. And you know, we would add, this was not in the book, but we would add things like uranium mining and its impact on Native Americans in the Southwest, for example. All of these insurmountable risks um, that nuclear power has never addressed, and it's been around since 1957 in the United States at Shipping Port, Pennsylvania, the first so-called civilian atomic reactor built by the nuclear Navy <laughs> as sort of a um, propagandistic, um, our friend the atom, nuclear power is the way to go, uh, moved by the Eisenhower administration in 1957, which was unfortunate because the Truman administration in 1948 had said solar is the future. It's called the Paley Commission. Unfortunately, Eisenhower decided to go down the nuclear power road, but the reason that they did so was for nuclear weapons purposes to justify the expansion of uranium mining and processing all things nuclear was being sold by the Eisenhower administration as our friend, the atom, the peaceful atom. And uh, it was really a propaganda move. There's a great book by Arjun Makajani of IEER called The Nuclear Power Deception. And those deceptions continue in the year 2021. We have to fight against them at every turn. Kevin, what are, what are, the, are the issues that Vermonters can keep in mind right now and act upon? I would encourage Vermonters and folks in Massachusetts and New Hampshire to regular, regularly attend and follow developments of the Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Advisory Panel. Um, take part, it is a public forum. There are opportunities for public comment, uh, public questions. You can even communicate with the ENDACAP in between meetings through email and other ways, get them in a better position. Vermont has been a leader on these issues by the closure of Vermont Yankee against all odds. That was very hard won in 2014. It was grassroots people power that led to that victory. And we need Vermont's leadership on decommissioning now and also high level radioactive waste policy in this country. So I encourage that participation, not only to defend your own self-interests as a state, but also to help the country get to a better position on environmental justice. Thank you, Kevin Camps. And uh, well, we'll sign off now. If you have is any, 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 anything that you'd like to say to, to close our, our meeting and we'll invite you back in, 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 a, in a hopeful year of 2021. I think we'll it is a very hopeful time, um, despite it all. Um, I'm reminded of something that Franklin Delano Roosevelt would say that then uh, John Dingell of Michigan, the longest serving member of Congress in history would say, 
and also Barack Obama, all Democrats, they would say, I know you're right, now make me do it. That was FDR's phrase. And it's a bit frustrating that leaders like that know what's right and require the public to make them do it, but that's the way things work. And that's what I call upon folks in Vermont listening to do to get Peter Welsh into a better position to help Bernie Sanders on his good positions. They know you're right, now make them do it. This is the nature of our democracy. And it's a very hopeful time in that regard. Thank you, Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear. And good to see you till next time. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Look forward to it, thanks. Thank you.